my name is Jorg Skuivers. Um, as uh, Chris told you, um, in the past I've mainly worked for uh, small startups. Um, I like prototyping stuff, so I usually help them with their for first product. And then I move on to something else. I had my own startup, which failed, and currently I'm just uh, employed by a company. And my talk is titled uh, Real World Software Interactions. Uh, I think we all currently write software um, that changes pixels on screen. It's something that happens on screen. It might write some data somewhere, but it's all virtual. Um, and what I will be talking about is actually changing stuff around us, so physical objects. And what that basically means is I'll be talking about gadgets, how to connect to gadgets, connect to your shoe, lights, watches, and all kinds of stuff. And we'll do that using a uh, fairly recent technology. It's called Bluetooth Smart. Bluetooth Smart is a new technology part of the latest version of Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth 4. And as Sheldon Cooper once said, everything is better with Bluetooth. Well, I completely disagree, actually. Um, my first experience with Bluetooth was a Palm device. You could beam files around. You could chat using Bluetooth. Or you had to be within 20 meters, so you could also just shout to someone. But um, it was slow. It's, it takes a while to set up, five seconds. You have to enter a pin code. Pairing just sucks. So why would I talk about Bluetooth again? I hate it. Well, Bluetooth Low Energy is kind of new. It's not backwards compatible. It actually requires a new chip, a new radio, and it ha has a totally different goal. Um, instead of sending data faster, it's actually sending less data at a very slow throughput. However, the latency is much better. So uh, it's fairly quick to set up a connection. It's milliseconds instead of, instead of seconds. And which makes it ideal for certain kind of users. And that, that's mainly the use of uh, sensor data. So you'll be talking about um, sensors that send small amounts of data. Um, it's, it's used in health and sports, for example. So you'll be sending a heart rate for, or small amounts of data, small pulses, maybe a few times a second. But it's not so much data that you'll be like voice data, for example. So you won't be able to, to uh, use low energy for uh, headsets or all the traditional stuff. It's a new use and it's kind of confusing. I don't know why they called it Bluetooth again because it's a totally different thing. And currently there are not that many gadgets available yet or devices that use the technology. Um, I think the first device came out like a year ago which was a heart rate uh, sensor. I'm actually currently wearing one. Uh, I'll show you in a minute. And over the past year, more and more gadgets have become available with new users, and people are still figuring out what to use it for. So like I said, I have a heart rate monitor on me right now. And I'll try to show you. So let's, let's pray to the demo gods. There it is. Uh, as you can see, I'm kind of like excited to be here. Um, if I jump around, it will probably raise a little bit more. And um, this is actually a Quartz Composer. So I wrote a custom Quartz Composer patch that connects to my heart rate monitor using Bluetooth. And um, it shows a nice animation. And as I speak, my heart rate goes up. Um, so that, that's one of the current uses for this. And let's switch back to my presentation. Cool. So this is an iOS conference. I'm an iOS developer, but I also do Mac stuff. I recently launched my first Mac app. And this technology is currently also available on a Mac. So I've listed a few of the Apple devices that currently support Bluetooth 4 uh, and at the same time Bluetooth Smart. And as for the iPhone, uh, iPod Touch, it's available since the iPhone 4S. And the latest iterations of the iPod Touch also have this technology on board. iPad, as of iPad version 3, first Retina one, 
the MacBook Pros as of the MacBook Air and the MacBook Retinas, and the um, uh, Mac Mini also have chips on board that support this technology. Uh, I think the only device Apple sells that doesn't support this is the Mac Pro. Uh, even the Apple TV has it on board. They just didn't enable it yet. So the framework to use this in your own app is um, Core Bluetooth. Core Bluetooth is available on iOS as of 10.5 and was updated in 10.6 with new capabilities. And it's also available on Mountain Lion. And it's always there, even if the machine doesn't contain a chip, you can check if the device actually supports the technology or if it's enabled, the user can actually disallow you to use the technology or just turn Bluetooth off. This is actually the first technology um, that doesn't require a uh, licensing program from Apple. So this is the first time you can actually use your iOS device to connect to external accessories directly without licensing. So previously it was possible, but you had to be in a licensing program, which was kind of hard and only possible if you had like a retail section or something to actually sell your own uh, accessory, which was for Apple a way to ensure that everything worked. Because like I told you, Bluetooth kind of sucks. And they wanted to make sure that it actually worked before you sold something that accompanied an iPhone. So the framework has two uh, pillars or use cases. And the first one is uh, the central mode. The central mode basically means that you're acting as a host device and you'll be connecting to other gadgets or small sensors. Um, and basically the device manages all the radio activity and uh, radio activity. Um, and you connect to that database with published information or connections uh, using a CB central manager, which is a class uh, you provide it with a delegate and you use this class to scan for nearby devices or uh, to connect to, to devices. Devices are called peripherals and peripherals you use to send data and read data to uh, from. And each peripheral has a number of published services. So uh, a gadget could act as a uh, heart rate sensor, which means that it publishes a service with a, according to a specific uh, standard, in this case the heart rate, which publishes heart rate, but it could just as well publish another service with device information, so you can actually request the name of the device. And every service has a number of uh, characteristics, which are basically the values you read or write. Then the other rule uh, in uh, Core Bluetooth is the peripheral rule, um, which is basically uh, acting or pretending to be a gadget or a device. So it's only available on iOS 6, and basically you use this to create a service. So uh, you can basically use this to communicate from one device to the other, uh, so from Mac to iPhone or iPhone to iPhone. Um, so basically what you could do with this is emulate a heart rate service in your own software without actually uh, being a sensor. And it's a similar uh, setup. You have a manager, again, where you publish a mutable service. A mutable service is just the description of the service you publish. And you create a few characteristics, um, which can be uh, read, write, or streaming. Uh, so uh, as a central, you can connect to a characteristic with uh, a flag like notify me whenever this changes. So the device is able to push new data to the central. And all of this can also work in the background. So there are two new uh, backgrounding modes for your iOS software. Uh, this is, of course, not needed uh, on the Mac. But um, your software can basically run in the background and still browse for new devices nearby or publish itself as a service. Uh, there are a few caveats to this because Apple will try to save battery life. So as when you publish a service, it will actually not broadcast as much information as before. And when you uh, browse for services, you can connect to devices, but as soon as you disconnect again, you're not able to connect again. This might actually be a bug. 
But, uh, so that's another thing with the core Bluetooth framework. It's fairly recent. Documentation was kind of lacking. Uh, it has improved, but there are a few use cases which are not documented. So at some point, you can just be stuck with something and be wondering, OK, document documentation says it should work. Why doesn't it work? Um, so another small demo. I have a application prepared. And I'll show a, a, a small use case on how to get started with your own software. OK, it shows orange, which on my screen is red. So basically, this is a uh, traffic light. So currently, it's red. It's currently scanning for new devices. and. On my phone, I have a different application which actually publishes a service. So currently it's red, and if I start my service, it should have changed to orange in this case. And if I move closer to my uh, laptop, it cha cha changes to green, as in, oh, you're now close. So basically, this is a similar use case to NFC. I can detect the range of so I know it's now near my laptop and turns green. So it, this is, I'm not even connecting to the service. I'm just scanning for services and detect how far or how near they are, which it has its own use cases. Um, and I'll try to show some code that makes this possible. See if it fits on screen. Okay, so this requires me to turn around a little. Um, is this readable for everyone? Okay, cool. So basically, this is the line where I set up a manager with myself as a delegate, and um, I scan for nearby peripherals. Um, here, I don't pass any options to the scanning method, but you can basically say, ignore everything but devices with a certain service. Um, for example, heart rate service. Uh, currently, I just scan for everything. And because I want to know how far or how close they are, I pass in one option, which is allow duplicates. Uh, usually, when you're scanning, you get a callback for every single device detected, but never more than once. So you should save it somewhere and do whatever you want. But I'm actually interested in updates in its um, uh, broadcast strength or detected strength, which this is the did discover uh, delicate method. And I created my own service. Uh, I'll get to it, back to that later. but. Uh, Basically, I have a RSSI uh, value, which is the received signal indicator strength. And that's basically a uh, decibel value of how, st how, uh, how close someone was broadcasting to you. So that, that's all I'm doing currently. Uh, I'm not even connecting. I, I just see what's around and base my application on that. So all information about this technology is available here uh, on developer.bluetooth.org. And um, they have a membership structure. Uh, you can basically ignore that. Uh, they have a free membership, which is kind of useless. Um, they send you an email once in a while with updates. Now I know they're working on a version 2 of the standard. And they're working on IP over uh, LE. So IPv6 over low energy. Um, but that's probably years away. Uh, what is interesting on this website, and you don't need a, a membership for that, is the standardization. So I, I've, I've showed you the heart rate. And it would be 
kind of silly if every manufacturer of heart rate uh, monitors would create a different standard. So they uh, publish a set of profiles of common use cases of this uh, technology, uh, one of which is heart rate, um, and other is sport sensors like blood, pr blood pressure, uh, time, proximity. And each profile de basically defines which services should be implemented uh, should you want to conform to the, uh, to the profile. And in this case, the heart rate monitor defines two services, a heart rate service and a device info service. So the device info is just the name of the device. But the heart rate service specifies a few characteristics to be implemented, and one of which is the heart rate itself, of course. Another is the sensor location. So this sensor is around my chest, but I've seen sensors around your wrist, for example. Uh, so you could use that information too. So these are the standardized services. What I actually did in my own demo was create my own service. No one else will use it. Um, it's just something for my own thing. And it's probably useless to have a standard for that. Um, so they created a mechanism to have your own services, independent of the standardized ones. And so the standardized services all use, uh, so every, actually every service is in, identified by a UUID, a unique number which says, okay, this is a heart rate service or this is a device info service. And the standardized service use 16 or 32-bit 30, numbers to indicate the name of the service. If you want to define your own service, you can just you know, generate your own UUID of 128-bit, which is fairly unique, I think. Yeah, so no one else will actually have the same name. And this happens a lot because the standardized process is running you know, basically a year behind the fact. Um, so they create a, create a standard if they see a lot of use cases. But most people don't need, know the use case of this technology yet. So there are a few watches available now, but there's no watch service yet or a service to push a watch face to a device. So the manufacturers of those watches just create their own service. And uh, I, I'll actually show how I implemented the Quartz Composer patch. So this is quite similar to the previous example, but here I actually scan for services, for specific service, and in this case, a 180D uh, uh, number, which is just the hex value for uh, the number of the heart rate standard. So it will ignore all other present devices, so um, it will just find heart rate belts in this case. Here's that number again. So as soon as it found one, it will actually try to connect to the uh, heart rate belt. And as soon as it connected, I have a wrapper class that wraps the peripheral in uh, my own custom thing, a heart rate sensor. Um, and this will actually manage the, this is basically a wrapper that provides the, de the delegate for the peripheral. With a published property heart rate that will change as soon as new data has become available. And so you use the, the, the central manager to scan for devices, the peripheral you use to connect to the, dev the device. And as soon as you're connected, like we did in, on the manager, you actually start discovering services on this peripheral. It will, at some point, give back or uh, a delegate call uh, with the discovered service for heart rate.
then you go on discovering the characteristics. So basically, we know those things are available, but our code still needs to discover them uh, on the device, because the device could implement them, but could also just leave out a few things. Uh, so you want to make sure that it's available on the device. And here you actually ask for a notification of the heart rate. Uh, so as soon as it is discovered, you ask for a notification, which basically means that uh, your app will receive another delegate call. It's a lot of uses of delegates um, with the data. So basically, you receive an NS data object. And from that, you can get a single value. So basically, the, all the heart rate monitor does is send you eight or 16 bytes of data. So that's all. So um, that's how you connect to a heart rate sensor. So I'm a software developer. I hate electronics. I hate soldering. Uh, so I currently use existing devices. Um, it'll, it's perfectly possible to create your own hardware, of course, if you've got the experience. Um, there are a few uh, extensions to um, uh, Arduino. There are shields available with, uh, which have a Bluetooth uh, chip on there. And this is a Kickstarter project, uh, which is basically Arduino, but shrunken to the size of a small coin. And it also has uh, Bluetooth LE uh, shields available. Uh, another interesting project to check out is uh, Luchi, which is basically using Arduino to create a uh, LED light controllable uh, using your phone. Um, like I said, I don't do soldering, but I do have... I brought a light myself. Let's see if this works. So it's currently on, and this is another... Let's see if that works. So basically, I can control this light using my phone to change its color. Um, I've ordered this one with the assumption, OK, I can use this in my living room. I wouldn't recommend that. It's horrible quality lighting. It's still very artificial. Um, the software is crap. Um, so that, that's basically one of the things I'll be doing tomorrow on the hackathon. I'll be, try to, uh, I'll be trying to reverse engineer the protocol they use for this. Uh, I'll just decompile the app or something uh, to see if I can create better software. Um, because it's a nice thing, but it just only buy it really if you are interested in gadgets and just want to play with this. Uh, I intend to have it somewhere in my office and change the lighting if the build fails or something. But um, so the, they still need to learn how to make LED lighting for this. So I actually thought it was like a scam because it took five months before it actually arrived. Um, but they actually sell it now. So um, it's called Bluetooth Bulb. And I think the URL is bluetoothbulb.com. I'll, I'll post that somewhere online. Um, uh, if you're interested. So, almost near the end. Um, small word on the future. Um, Apple now has this technology in almost all the devices they currently sell. So I expect something to arrive in the future from Apple that uses this technology. Um, for one, a keyboard. Uh, it's probably, if they release a keyboard with a single coin cell on it, it can probably run for a year, year and a half, instead of the six weeks my current Bluetooth keyboard uh, uh, runs on. Um, and a lot of use cases still have 
to be discovered. So I intend to create my own software for this to see what's possible. Uh, people talk about uh, the Internet of Things, everything connected. I don't believe in that. But maybe this is a step towards the direction. Um, yeah, that was it. Um, I have a website where I try to collect all available devices that support this technology. It's on the URL specified. Uh, it has a small list of gadgets that connect to your phone. So if there are any questions, uh, if there's any time left, uh, there's time left. So if, there's, if there are any questions that, yeah, just, I think you, ah, there's a mic, nice. Uh, so uh, th this allows us to um, consume Bluetooth LE um, services. Does it also allow us to create and host our own services on the Mac or on the iPhone? Not on the Mac, but uh, so that's the peripheral role I was talking about. Uh, maybe that was not that clear, but um, the peripheral role is basically used to create services, yes. So the, the demo I showed you uh, where my phone near the computer would turn the screen into a different color. That's a service running on my phone, and the, the Mac is basically scanning for that service and detecting its signal strength. But that's only iOS 6. Any other questions? Mm. Oh. Ah. Uh, how big is uh, the range of the peripheral? One or two meters, or it, it depends on the on the peripheral itself. So an Arduino thing will have a shorter range, but if it's a, a, a professionally produced thing with a strong battery. Um, up to 50 meters, I think. Uh, so it's a quite long range. Uh, um, can you give us some feedback about the reliability of the uh, framework, the Core Bluetooth framework? Does it work fine, or is it just public beta of Apple? Well, the documentation is was lacking. It, it is improving, but um, I can show you one instance, for example, of something that was not documented. Um, basically, if there is a, uh, if you're scanning for devices, a connect to one, um, let's see where I did that again. Um, This part. So this is a not documented thing, but basically, if you just connect to a device, uh, nothing will happen. Uh, you don't get a, a delegate callback. Um, you actually need to retain or make sure that the peripheral you're connecting to stays around. So it's easy to assume you just connect and then you get a delegate callback disconnect uh, with the same peripheral. But that, that's not happening. You actually need to retain the peripheral, which is not documented. So uh, if you're starting with this, um, it's very easy to overlook this, because it, nowhere the documentation says retain this thing if you're connecting. Um, and you don't get an error. Uh, you just don't get a callback. So you might be wondering, do I, am I doing something wrong? Um, so the, the, it is a recent framework. And, the, and with all the things that Apple creates and not users themselves, there will be use cases which are not documented. And they're not using this technology yet in any of their own products, like poor data and iCloud syncing. Uh, they don't do that either, uh, which results in yeah, unexpected behavior. Um, so it is a new framework, and you will run into things like this. Uh, I've got one question about reverse engineering of protocols for those devices. Um, is there some kind of service description coming from the device itself? And is it like hard to actually, or is it feasible to reverse engineer um, the protocol? There are tools to sniff the, 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 the data being sent by, uh, uh, so basically a peripheral broadcasts a certain set of information, and that's unencrypted, uh, basically. So unless you specify it needs to be encrypted, but you could just sniff that. 
uh, is fairly weak, weakly secured. So you don't want to do payments over this protocol. Um, but tomorrow I'll just probably decompile the binary and see what, what happens. That's probably easier because I don't have the tools to actually receive and debug uh, wireless data. Okay.